I wanted to say to all the young activists in the room that if you work really hard and volunteer for 20 years, you, you might someday get a chance to introduce a state senator. Just want to enjoy this moment. <laughs> senator Mark Leno represents the 11th Senate District of California, which includes San Francisco Daly City, Colma, Broadmoor, and portions of South San Francisco. Prior to his election to the Senate, he served on the San Francisco Board of Supervisors from 1998 to 2002 and six years in the State Assembly. Senator Leno has been a champion for us in Sacramento and also in his earlier career. He's in advanced hemp legalization, medical marijuana research, employment rights legislation, a wonderful, neat little bill, 1182, last year that would have uh, legalized sales in a way that we really need to do in California. <clears throat> and significantly, he was the author of the 2010 decriminalization bill that was signed by Governor Schwarzenegger. That was the first decriminalization we saw of medical mar or of marijuana in 40 years. So I am pleased to introduce Mark Leno. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you, Ellen, for the very gracious and generous introduction, and thank you for the invitation to be with you all here today, and thank you for joining this conference. It's very impressive, both in numbers and clearly the quality of the legal talent that we have here today is not insignificant. Michael, thank you so much for taking on Daisy's cause and for doing it so <laughs> successfully, and Daisy, I hope you're feeling the love because I know you're going through hell right now and you're going to get to the other side of it and your family will be brought back together. So much for family values and keeping families together, but you will prevail because the power of your spirit is so clear and so strong. And James, I just want to say that uh, whatever my next campaign may be, I want you to chair my fundraising committee. <laughs> And Omar, I'm going to sleep better at night knowing that you're on, on the scene and, and raising your voice and doing the good work that you're doing. So there's, I guess my message here today is going to be that it's a really schizophrenic world that we're all living with in this movement because there are horrible, heart-wrenching stories. And we know that Daisy's is not the only one and that good people are being sent off to federal penitentiary for ungodly numbers of years. Families are being ripped apart. There's, there's real pain, and we all know it all too well. But I also want to say that, strangely enough, we're having extraordinary successes all at the same time. The voters of Colorado and Washington certainly knew what they were doing this last November. And at the same time, we've got President Obama telling Barbara Walters that he's got bigger fish to fry when it comes to having the feds come in and counter what the voters have done in Washington and in Colorado. His U.S. attorneys continue to cause such havoc here in California, and it's just uh, outrageous. It's outrageous what his U.S. attorneys are doing under his auspices, and so there's no sense to it. There's just no sense. It's everyone's bouncing off of walls, and uh, Omar is right. We do need much greater clarity in law so that law-abiding people are not going to get swept up. And I think just the fact of the U.S. attorneys not only threatening property confiscation of landlords who would dare to rent to dispensaries operating under the auspices of state law is an indication of their extreme actions, and going so far as to even threaten media outlets, radio, television, newspapers, newspapers that are fighting for their life for every advertising dollar they can get, threatening them that they'll face federal prosecution if they dare take advertising money. 
from marijuana interests. So this is just over the top and out of control, and there is a lot of work to be done. We know that. So you might be wondering, and Omar certainly is, why doesn't the legislature just get its act together and do something? Because we should be. And I want to give you just a, an insight into what goes on in the legislature and why we don't have more success than we do. And then I want to end on some success that we have had. So we did get a bill to Governor Schwarzenegger's desk a couple years ago, which would have put in statute a medical cannabis patient's right to employment so that one could not be fired, not for cause, but for status of being a medical cannabis patient. What an obvious thing to be able to do. Why should someone lose their job or lose the opportunity to work just because of who they are as a medical cannabis patient? We want patients to get better, to be able to be able to work, and to be able to sustain themselves rather than be on the taxpayer's role. That makes obvious sense. But unfortunately, Schwarzenegger vetoed the bill. The California Chamber of Commerce has come out in our subsequent tries, and we weren't even able to get it to Jerry Brown's desk in our most recent attempt, though I'm here to say I am completely prepared to reintroduce the bill if we can get the kind of support we need. And I'm, and I'm talking about finding some small business interests and other business interests to come be in support of the bill so that we can counter the California Chamber of Commerce because they very much frightened too many of my colleagues, preventing us from getting to the 21 votes in the Senate that we needed. Additionally, we tried very minimally, and I want to credit my colleague Assemblyman Tom Amiano in his introduction of a bill <laughs> on the Assembly side to set up a structure in California so that we can tax and regulate here in the state. Unfortunately, that didn't go anywhere in the Assembly. We tried a much more mild approach in the Senate, which was just to put into statute a right for dispensaries to receive compensation as long as they abide it by then Attorney General Jerry Brown's guidelines. We couldn't get that through the Senate. Gives you an indication that my colleagues are afraid of their own shadows when it comes to this issue because it's not a controversial issue when 75% of the electorate support the medical use of cannabis here in California and even across the nation. Why Congress is frozen in its tracks makes no more sense than why the California legislature is. It's not a controversial issue. We did move a Senate joint resolution. Resolutions, of course, are not binding law, but it urges the federal government to stop the raids in California, number one, and number two, to set up a federal structure so that there is, in federal law, allowances for safe and affordable access for patients to get their medicine. But again, that's not binding, it's just urging the federal government and then we did have success in making possession of less than an ounce of marijuana an infraction, not a misdemeanor in California. And it was an anomalous situation before we got that into law because there was only one misdemeanor in the entire California Penal Code which didn't allow for some jail time in punishment, but just a $100 fine. And by definition of punishment, it always was an infraction, not a misdemeanor. And that was possession of less than an ounce of marijuana. We had superior court judges coming to the state legislature every year and say, begging, please change this law. A misdemeanor case allows a defendant to have a jury trial Jury trials of this nature clog our court system and we're already underfunded, preventing other access to justice uh, cases to come forward. And 
a jury trial costs taxpayers $1,000 minimally, at the end of which you're found guilty, pay a $100 fine. That's a loss of $900 per case, and we had tens of thousands of cases. Do the math, it was costing the state tens of millions of dollars for this nonsensical misdemeanor charge for possession, which had an infraction penalty. So I just want to share with you some of the success that we've had just in the first year of implementation. The arrests overall in California for marijuana is down 86%. We have effectively decriminalized possession of marijuana for any use in California, and that is significant. Arrests for adults is down 95%. So that means among those under 21, marijuana-related arrests are down 60%. 60%, meaning all of those young people not entering into our juvenile justice system at all. And given that in other states, the proposals are always for allowing use for those over 21. It doesn't benefit youth. Here in California, we are protecting our youth because this is not for just those over 21. Everyone benefits from the infraction law that is now in place, and that's significant. In fact, since we put that into law, there is a 47% decrease in overall youth drug arrests, and so we're very happy with that. So as I said, schizophrenic. We've got these horrible stories on the one hand. We've got these great successes on the other. We've got voters across the country saying, yeah, people should be able to use marijuana, not just for medical use, but for any kind of use, and winning at the battle. And of course, then the president saying, yeah, we're going to let them be. We've got bigger fish to fry. So the work is signi significant. We've got a lot of work and effort yet to do. Uh, and I also don't want to overlook all of those here who are working hard to allowing our farmers in California to be able to grow industrial hemp. We got a bill that would have done just that to Governor Schwarzenegger's desk. Uh, he had an incomprehensible veto message, but that was his nature. Uh, and he vetoed it. We got another bill allowing California farmers to grow industrial hemp, and unfortunately, Jerry Brown vetoed it, but to his credit, it was a substantive veto message. He happens to be of an opinion different from my own that we are preempted by federal law, and California cannot, on its own, allow farmers to grow hemp. We've got our own explanation of why that doesn't make sense, so we've got the opportunity to change Jerry Brown's mind, but otherwise, I would be very eager to get engaged in a statewide ballot measure that would let voters decide whether or not to let California farmers grow hemp. And we would win at the ballot because voters understand that hemp is not a drug, and in fact, Congress knowingly, and this is our de legal defense, knowingly exempted industrial hemp from the Controlled Substances of Act of 1970 because it's not a drug, and they knew that. <clears throat> but this is a jobs bill. This will create thousands and thousands of new jobs. We know that those who are legally manufacturing hemp products here in California today, food, clothing, shelter, beauty products, the, the list is long, thousands and thousands of legal products legally being manufactured, if they could identify a secure source of the hemp product rather than being dependent upon the vagaries of the weather patterns in Canada and whatever else is going on in Mexico, that they would expand their production. We'd be building more factories. Manufacturing jobs would be created. We'd have more tax revenue. It would be good for the state of California on so many levels. And of course, as you all know, we can grow hemp without herbicides, without fungicides, without pesticides. It's safer for the environment. 
and it grows with less water in a state that's going to be facing perpetual droughts in the years ahead. So it makes sense on many, many levels. So I think as we leave today, we recognize that we need to redouble our efforts on so many of the legal fronts. We have activism that we can engage in to protect mothers like Daisy from future situations, and that we should be encouraged and know that there's a lot of great things that we can do in the years ahead. So I'm jazzed, I'm energized, and I'm recommitting my efforts legislatively. Got four more years in the state Senate before I get booted out. <laughs> <clears throat> if I ever have the opportunity to serve, and it would be a great honor to serve San Francisco in, this, in the House of Representatives, I would make these issues my, one of my top priorities in Washington. Thank you very much.